We say God loves us. We write about it, sing about it, post online about it, but we struggle to truly believe it. Maybe we've experienced the gospel at some point, but we moved on, thinking it was for those who've never heard it before. But we've still got our secret sins, relationships that are broken. After all, how can we expect to love others if we don't really believe that God loves us unconditionally? The gospel is the most beautiful thing we've ever heard. And yet, it just seems so unbelievable. How can one man's story change our own? It's just too good to be true. Or is it? Hello, friends. Oh, that was a beautiful response. We've really worked this out. We've got a good relationship going. I am so glad to see all of you here. Those of you watching online, we love you as well. You're our family from afar. This evening, you are in for an amazing, amazing, amazing worship and presentation. And again, our Q&A. Last night, if you were here and you were able to take part in the Q&A, I don't know how many of you were like, wait a minute, don't stop, keep going. The responses were so good, I could have been here for like hours. And so I want to actually put up the QR code right now. I want you to make sure you have the opportunity to put in your questions for David, Ty, and Jeffrey based on the presentations from this morning, if you've been able to watch online, you can check out the Real Religion presentations. David did a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation called Faith and Reason this morning. Really challenged so many of my assumptions. The students were silent and in awe. And then you can do any responses or questions based on these evening presentations. And so if I could ask you right now, would you pull out your cell phone and you would scan the QR code. When you scan that, you can do it online as well as you're watching on your screen. Hopefully, if you're watching on your phone, you can uh, take the URL that's on there, lluc.info slash poll, where it says write your response. That's where your question goes. So please, again, I'm going to share, share a question based on the presentations, not something really anything else, uh, we won't be discussing that if it isn't pertaining to the presentations. Friends, I also want to tell you, God has been moving in this place. God has been moving in this place. I felt like we were on the verge of some kind of a revival last night where the Holy Spirit was just doing something incredible. When you lift Jesus up, all people will be drawn to him. Friends, last evening when we were talking about Jesus and, and Professor Rosario was discussing just the significance of the cross, and it just broke my heart. And the addition to our worship, if you've been blessed by the worship, can you just give a hand to these incredible, incredible friends of ours? Oh, my. You know, when you can lift your hearts up to Jesus and sing out to him, there is nothing better. I do this every day. It feels like we're experiencing Pentecost together this week, a gathering we, day after day. And so now I just want to encourage you to continue that in your heart and in your home as the weeks go on. And we have some wonderful follow-up uh, ideas that we have for you, and so I want you to be prepared. This is not the end. Once Saturday night comes, we're having some more time together. And so I hope you're ready for that. At this time, I just want to encourage you to greet someone next to you. Give a warm hand out to someone. Give someone a hug and say hi to them. I'm going to just talk to our camera here and invite our friends online to say something. Friends, we love you.
we are so glad that you're watching. You know, it is such a blessing that you are sharing these messages. The first message were on the first night, over 10,000 people have already watched the presentation and thousands more every single evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. We love you, we care for you, we want you to know you mean so much to us that you're watching online. And so blessings to each one of you as well. And I hope that you would interact with us. Comment on there. Tell us where you're watching from. Well, thank you so much, friends. God bless you. And worship with us now. As we stand together, if you are able and worship, continue worshiping together. Um, would you turn to the people around you now that you've embraced and would you just share uh, a moment of gratitude that you've experienced today just briefly share how has God been good today in your life what are you grateful for We have much to be grateful for, amen. Let's worship together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. 
without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dark. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, to reveal the kingdom come, and to our salvation, Jesus for our sake you Before we pray this evening, I just want to mention an email I received today from a former member of our community, a viewer now, Joyce McClintock, who said, as you pray each evening for the people who gather in the sanctuary and for the meetings, don't forget that there are many, many of us out here who are very much a part of what is happening there, and be sure and include us in your prayers as well. So tonight, to Joyce and to all the others who are here with us in heart, even if not in presence, we pray for you as well. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we do give you praise, as that, that beautiful song just said. 
We come worshiping and honoring you, adoring and reverencing you, thankful for the gift of love. Lord, this week, through the voices of three friends, in some cases new friends, and others old acquaintances, but of three voices this week, we have encountered you in ways in which we had not seen you before. And for that, we are profoundly grateful. We just ask that your spirit would rest on each one of these three friends, on David, on Jeffrey, and tonight on Ty, that your spirit would inspire, empower, and bless them, and through them, bless us. We thank you so much for the kind of God that you are. We place ourselves in your hands again this evening and ask for your presence in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming again. Not too long ago, a young couple came to me um, as their pastor, and the fact that they were so young made the situation all the more tragic and, and sad. Uh, as they sat down with me, they said, this isn't working. And I said, what's not working? This marriage. They had only been married a few years. It's not working. They were going to give just one last-ditch effort, as if to say, okay, okay, we're just going to sit here with you, take a stab at it. This is hopeless. We're done. But give it your best shot, Pastor. So I turned to him, and I said, well, let's, let's begin with you. What, what, what's the issue? He said, I, I just don't feel it anymore. I said, you don't feel what anymore? I, 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 don't, I don't love her. And she said, well, that makes two of us because I don't feel it anymore either. She looked straight into my eyes. She said, I, I just don't feel anything for him. In fact, I do feel some things about him, but nothing for him. I said, okay, well, we're just gonna cut to the chase. I'm gonna write you guys a prescription and send you out of here. And he said, we don't need medication. <laughs> I'm thinking in my mind, I think maybe you, he, you do, <laughs> but that's not my field, so I'm gonna write a different kind of prescription. And I just began jotting down some notes as they sat there looking confused. I folded the paper, and I said, I'm just gonna ask you to do what's on this paper, and then 30 days from now, come back, and we'll sit down again, and we'll just see where we're at. Are you willing to do that? He, he, he's wanting to peek at the paper. No, 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 no. You know me. We, we have a little bit of history together. I have your best interests at heart. Commit to do what's on the paper and come back in 30 days. It's just a month. Both of them looked at each other. They looked at me and they said, all right, whatever. We'll do what's on the paper. You guys take off for 30 days, do what's on the paper and come back. Well, 30 days later, they came back, we had another appointment, they come walking in to the room, big smiles on their faces. I think I saw him give her a wink. She gave him a nod. I think, okay, something's going on here. They sit down and I say, well, how are things going? And he says, I have no idea what I was thinking, she's incredible. I turned to her, how's it going? She says, oh, he's amazing. Oh. I could hear like a background choir of angels in my imagination. Now I'm smiling with them, three smiling faces. I says, well, well, well what happened? They said, you know what happened. I said, well, did you do what was on the paper? Did you follow the prescription? They said, yes, point made. We're in love. I said, well, I'm glad to hear that. Would you guys like to see the prescription? Would you like to see what was on the paper? Yes. I'm, I'm not going to show you unless you ask. You're going to have to want to see it. <laughs> Seriously, do you want to see what was on? Okay, so this is it. Here's what's on the paper. Here, here's what I wrote and handed to them. Okay, 
One part's a little risque, they're married, don't worry about it. <laughs> Number one, this is so simple, have one meal together at least three days every week. That's it, just eat together. Number two, every Monday night, share a knock-knock joke that you find on Google with each other. Two knock-knock jokes, back and forth. Number three, pray together at, at some point each day. Number three, read Proverbs 1 through 8 together, just a few verses each day, whatever you, whatever you can handle. Number five, have sex every Friday night. <laughs> Brings a whole new meaning for Philip to happy Sabbath. <laughs> Number six, every night before you go to sleep, say to one another, I love you. Now, he was peeking at the paper 30 days earlier as they were exiting, and he said, but I don't. I don't love her. And I said, say it anyway. He said, okay. 30 days later, we're sitting there smiling together. It is a profound reality of human psychology that we do not feel our way into right actions. Rather, we act our way into right feelings. Yes. If you're going to wait for the right feeling to do the right thing, you'll never do the right thing. And so what I want to explore with you is what I then shared with them in our second session. And it is something I'm just going to refer to as the love complex. Not in the sense that love is complicated, it's not complicated, it's easy to understand, but it is a complex in that it has more than one part. It has moving parts. It is a system. There is in the love complex, eros. They were familiar early in their relationship with the eros, the erotic aspect of love, the aesthetic aspect of love. That's what brought them together. But. Love is more and must be more within the matrimonial union than merely erotic attraction. The romantic part, what the, what the French call the ooh la la factor. Yes, that's important, it needs to be there, but that's not the whole enchilada. The enchilada has ingredients. And some of those ingredients are easily overlooked. Secondly, the phileo part. This is the friendship aspect of love, right? This is the emotional aspect. This is the companionship part. This is where you read in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 5, verse 16, where the Shulamite, the girl, says to her girlfriends about her man, he is my lover and my friend. The romantic part is coupled with the companionship part. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life was sitting, having a stack of pancakes and a Denny's all by myself and looking across the Denny's and there are two elderly people, like as old as earth. <laughs> there they are, the two of them sitting across from one another and they're smiling and they're, they're a little flirtatious and there's a little foot action going on under the table. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So am I, as I'm leaving, I say, how long have you known each other? What a stupid question. <laughs> We've been together approximately forever, she says. <laughs> and they're still in love. So the companionship part has to be the story. That's the familial part. That's the family part. We all have family. Last Thanksgiving, you remember the crazy people around the table. You may have been one of the crazy people around the table. Yeah, yeah, Uncle Bob, there's no way out. He is a part of your family. And some people are thinking, you're a part of this family. They're just there, you love them, is very principle-based. There's probably not companionship with every family member, but you love them and you will be there for them when they need you. And then there's agape. Agape is the pinnacle of the love complex. Agape is unilateral love. It seeks reciprocation, but it is primarily in itself unilateral. 
It is the love of principle. It is the love of doing what is right because it is right. And that's the dimension of love that carries you through the ups and downs of the emotional parts of the relationship that rise and fall. I want to talk to you tonight about the resurrection of Christ, perhaps in a way that you've not considered it before. Yes, the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the righteous. But the resurrection life of Christ is not simply a present, it's not simply a future tense reality. The resurrection life of Christ, according to the New Testament, is a present tense quality of life. Let's explore this. Wendell Berry is a poet farmer and one of my favorite poets of all time. He lives in Kentucky. Wendell Berry wrote these words, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing, love someone who does not deserve it, and then these profound words, practice resurrection. What? Practice resurrection? Isn't the resurrection of Christ a past tense historical event and the resurrection of the righteous a future tense eschatological final events type of experience? What does he mean, practice resurrection? Well, the word practice means the habitual application or use of an idea in the form of an action, like, like practicing the violin or the cello or the guitar. Are you tracking? That's what practice means. Practice resurrection. What is resurrection? Resurrection means coming alive from the dead. What does it mean to practice resurrection? It means, it means to, to enact life-giving principles in our relational dynamics. Do things that simulate, that resemble the resurrection of Christ. When? Now. In the present tense. We could say it like this. Live out the implications of the resurrection in the here and now, anticipating the future eschatological resurrection, and with an eye of adoration and praise to the past historical event of the resurrection of Christ. In other words, habitually bring dead things to life by your actions. Take the resurrection reality of Christ with you everywhere you go. Take it into your marriage. Speak life into your relationships. Take it with you to the grocery store in the interaction with the person who is checking you out and taking your money and bagging your groceries. Take the resurrection life of Christ into the dynamics between yourself and your children, the person who's giving your kids piano lessons, all the interactions that you engage in habitually bring dead things to life. Do things that are life-giving. In fact, Scripture says in the book of Proverbs, and this is why I told that young couple to read the first eight chapters of Proverbs, this is true of the whole book of Proverbs, but the first eight chapters in particular simply describe what love looks like in practical actions. For example, in the book of Proverbs, it says, life and a death are in the power of the tongue. What? I mean, think about it for a minute. Have you ever experienced stress in your body, like in the pit of your stomach or in your shoulders, where something has happened and it just doesn't feel right? Some disrespectful act, for example, and you feel it in your body. Well, something that might contribute to relieving that stress would be a kind word, a kind sentence from someone. Just think of how powerful this is. Think of how powerful this is. Man, I like you. You're amazing. What? You like me? I'm amazing? Nobody's told me that ever. Take the resurrection life of Christ into all relationships. Have lunch with someone. One time, I, I simply said the words, words. Hey, you want to have lunch? And the guy burst into tears. 
I thought, okay, well, maybe not. I thought everybody gets hungry. How about breakfast? If you don't like lunch, we don't have to have lunch. What about dinner? How about a little snacky poo? Do you want to just sit somewhere on a bench and eat some potato chips together? He looked at me and he said words I will never forget. He said, nobody has ever asked me to have lunch with them. He was at least in his 40s. He had lived decades alone. I could hardly contain my tears in his presence, but I did, and we had lunch. I didn't even know his name. He was just super chatty. After I, I, I preached a sermon, and he was like, like he had nobody in the world to say everything in his head to. I said, you want to have lunch? Because I thought he has a lot to say. He needs to say it to someone. We had lunch. It changed his life to just sit and eat crepes together. There is life and death in our actions, in our relational dynamics, in our words. So one thing that you need to understand about the gospel is something like this. The gospel, listen, is a prophetic vocation. Speak the truth, ellipses, wait for it. Speak the truth before it's true. Amen. You're amazing. Oh, I don't think she is. But I sure am speaking potential over her. If you relate to people according to their potential, they begin to aspire to be what you believe about them. This is the resurrection principle. This is the life-giving principle. This is the best way to raise children. Raise children by telling them, relating to them, and speaking over them what you want them to be, and they will, lo and behold, tend to gravitate in the direction of your words to them and about them. I made sure when our children were growing up not only to speak words of life over them and to them, but deliberately to make sure in the company of other adults that my children grew up hearing me tell other human beings, my kids are incredible. Here, I want you to meet Amber. <laughs> She's just, man, I am so blessed to be her dad. To this day, she's an adult woman, and her eyes will tear up when we talk about those little girl years and the daddy-daughter relationship. There is life in the tongue. Jesus himself articulated the underlying, kind of under the hood, the engine that drives resurrection life. In John chapter 10 and verse 17, I want you to notice the language very carefully. I lay down my life that, in order that, so that. He's describing a cause and effect relationship, you guys. I lay down my life that I might take it up again. Not I lay down my life period, full stop, and then God, the Father, is going to, by an act of fiat, resurrect me because he's powerful and he can. No, there's something in the mode of Christ's life and the laying of it down that generates the potential for ongoing sustained life into eternity future. Let's flesh this out. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. This is profound. Jesus says that I am life. I am resurrection life. There is something going on in my deep inner psychology and emotionality and morality and the kind of person I am is made of life. It's made of resurrection life. If you believe in me, which is not the trite, surface, ascent of Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, and then I'm going to move on with my life. It is if you believe in me, that is, if you believe in the kind of life, the quality of life, the dynamics you see operating in me, well, you're never going to die. 
Now, you may die the first death, which according to scripture is pretty inconsequential. It's a little nappy poo. And then you're going to be resurrected. You're going to die. Listen, listen very carefully. You don't get eternal life sometime in the future. You take it into the grave with you if you die, or if you are alive at the second coming, you meet Jesus with eternal life inside of you. You have it, and if you die and you're resurrected, you are resurrected with the eternal life you went into the grave with and you just pick up right where you left off, living out the quality of the life that is present in the person of Christ. He who loves his life will lose it. This is one of the great ironies of the gospel and the teachings of Jesus. He who loves his life that is to say, he who is essentially self-centered in his or her orientations will lose the life that you're holding on to as primary. I don't primarily exist for me. I exist for you. And you exist for me. You've got my back. I've got your back. And that's how the universe is meant to operate. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, if you just go over to, you know, John chapter 10, go back to John chapter 10, this is chapter 12, do you remember when Jesus says, I have come that you might have present tense life and that you might have it more abundantly? Another version says that you might have it to the full. You might translate that, I have come that you might have a higher quality of life that transcends the mere biological existence that you have. When Jesus speaks of life in the New Testament, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, it's the word zoe, not the word bio in the Greek. It's zoe life, not biological life merely. Yes, we're biologically alive. But are you aware that according to the New Testament, you can be biologically alive and spiritually dead, morally dead, emotionally dead, fully functional as a biological creature and void of empathy for anybody else around you? Void of love, but biologically alive and kicking. And then in chapter 17 of John, in verse 3, Jesus is praying to the Father, and we overhear this prayer. Jesus says, this is eternal life. Speaking to the Father, Father, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus, number one, says that the eternal life that he came to give us is a present tense reality. It's always spoken of, by the way, in the present tense in the gospel. And that it's not merely a quantity of life, but a quality of life that is defined by knowing God, by synchronicity with God. The word knowing there, Jesus is a Hebrew, and he's, you know, this is the New Testament, it's written in Greek, but he's a Hebrew, and he's, he's pulling from the yada Hebrew concept of intimacy. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and brought forth a son. Not merely analytical knowledge, Adam didn't get Eve pregnant by contemplating her. Women don't get pregnant by being contemplated. It's describing the intimate act of matrimonial union that gives rise to conception and a child. And, and Jesus then takes that metaphor, the metaphor of the most intimate act known to human beings, the most vulnerable act known to human beings, and he says, Father, eternal life is intimacy with you. He doesn't say eternal life is to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's a given. Yeah, it's forever, but it's not made of days and weeks and months and years. The substance of the thing is intimacy with God, synchronicity with God, with the heart of God, with the character of God. The resurrection life of Jesus is made of something. It's composed of something. We don't need to guess what it's composed of. The gospel tells us what it's made of, and it's profound. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, John tells us we know that we have, past tense, it's over, I'm, I've crossed a line. 
that we have passed from death to life. Okay, John, how do we know? Because we love. That's how we know. Do you want tangible evidence of the resurrection life of Christ in your life? We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren, the brothers and the sisters, our fellow human beings. Now check this out. And he who does not love his brother, his fellow human being, abides in death. As much as the resurrection, salvation life of Christ is love, it's composed of love, it's made of love, you can know you have it by the present activity of love. Just so, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you can know exactly what death is made of. Death is made of hatred. You know this if you pause to think about it. Anytime you have ever, ever felt disrespected by someone, demeaned by someone, anytime insulting words have been spoken to you or an abusive act has been performed against you, something in you was injured. You, you, you incrementally died a little bit by the disrespect, by the abuse. Hatred is destructive. It steals life away from us. Love is life. I'm not making this up. I'm simply telling you what Scripture says. Love is life, and hatred is death. In chapter 5 of 1 John, verse 12, he goes on and he says, he who has the Son has life. Let me just pause right here and ask you. This is not an arrogant statement that I'm asking you to make. This isn't, this isn't bold and proud and audacious. This is just a gospel reality. Can, can you say with, with firmness, can you, I can say it, can you say it? Let's say it together. Do you have Jesus? Yes. Do you, is he yours because you're his? Yes. Well, you, you were his first, and he laid claim to you, and then you became conscious of it, and you said, well, I like you too. You love me, I love you back. His love is primary, yours is secondary. His love is creative, yours created. Do you have Jesus? Yes, I do. Well, if you have Jesus, you have life. The resurrection life of Jesus is coursing through your veins, your emotional veins, your psychological processing. If you have Jesus, you have life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You may be biologically alive, but the principles of life that are present on display in Christ are not present in me when I am living in disdain and hate and disrespect for others. It doesn't mean that I never make mistakes. We're talking here about a general trajectory and a posture of existence that sometimes involves saying, oh, that was just a very lame way of interacting. Jesus, forgive me. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means your general trajectory and your posture is one of life and life giving to others. These things, in verse 13, I have written to you who believe in the name, that is the character, the operational principles that are present and on display in Christ. These things I have written to you, John says, the whole, I've been telling you a bunch of stuff in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And he comes to the conclusion, he says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have, present tense, eternal life. Okay, so in order to make the point, and please don't take this as some kind of arrogant statement, but as a, as a gospel reality, to make the point, I'm going to say to you, I, I, a human being is standing before you this evening. My name is Ty Gibson. I am presently, I am in possession of eternal life. Amen. I have it. I'm not going to get it later on, like at the second coming of the resurrection. I have it right now. I'm trucking along through life in possession of it toward the second coming. 
And if I die, I'm going to take it into the grave with me. I'm going to pick up right where I left off at the resurrection and keep on living. I'll get a new model, a new body, a new, a new physical shell, right? I'm looking for a better model, in fact. I got a pain in my left knee, man. I'm telling you, I want a, kind, I want a Tesla kind of body, so to speak. You know, I want, I want a new, a new, brand new bod, but psychologically, emotionally. Listen, one of the glorious truths of the New Testament is that we grow older biologically and younger morally, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally. But as you receive the gospel, as you drink it in, as you process the realities that are present in Christ, you're turning back the clock of time on your mind and your heart. You're becoming more, more gentle and kind and innocent and playful and kind and more secure in your own skin and less worried about anything except for the audience of one and to be concerned with the audience of one, that is Jesus, is to see everybody around you through the lens that is his resurrection life. So I'm growing younger as I'm growing older. Are you? Do you feel it? Do you sense innocence returning to the fine mechanisms of your soul? Do you, do you sense that the hardness and the jadedness is giving way to greater sensitivity? Do you find yourself becoming more polite, more kind, more gentle? Do you find your conscience being more stimulated by the ugliness that you cultivated for years and now it's beginning to give way to beauty in your personality? Yes, you do. To know Jesus is to possess eternal life. The resurrection life of Christ is a present reality that is operational in his followers. Again, to, 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 to quote Wendell Berry, practice resurrection. Yes, there is the historical event of the resurrection of Christ. There is the eschatological event of the resurrection of the righteous of all ages. And there is the present practice of the principles that are inherent in the resurrection. But let's shift our attention to death for a moment. Because the inverse is also true. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we have this description of death, what it is, and how it operates. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, when it matures in you, when you cultivate it, when you let it continue expanding and taking up emotional space inside of you. Sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. Okay, let's pause and just define the word sin here. The word sin in Scripture does not describe violating a list of arbitrary rules made up by an arbitrary God. I heard a, 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 a preacher one time in a sermon go off into this direction of, yeah, we have the Ten Commandments, but, but that's just God's law. He could have come up with ten other ones. No, he couldn't have. No, he couldn't have. The Ten Commandments are a description of the psychology of God. The Ten Commandments describe what love looks like in vertical and horizontal relational dynamics. The Ten Commandments are not arbitrary. They weren't pulled out of a hat. They were expressed out of God's identity. So, so what is sin? According to the New Testament in 1 John, sin is transgression of the law. And what is that law? Well, according to Romans chapter 13, verse 10, the law is love. Love does no harm, Paul says, to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law, Romans 13, 10. What, what is the law? The law is love. It is absolute, pure, other-centeredness. It is self-givingness. This is, this is God. This is how God thinks and feels and behaves. God is love, which is to say God is absolutely 
other-centered in all God's orientations. God's never, ever done anything that was in his best interest to the bad outcome of you and me by some kind of arbitrary fiat or control, God operates by the principle of love. Sin is a death-dealing principle. And James is probably pulling this from Proverbs chapter 8. Look at these words. Just allow yourself to be blown away by this. Whoever finds me, me here is personified wisdom. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is the pre-incarnate Christ. Christ is the wisdom of God, Paul says. The wisdom that we encounter in Proverbs is equivalent to the logos or the word that we encounter in John chapter 1. So, so he who finds me, just, just personified wisdom, Jesus, God, he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Check this out. But he who sins against me against the principles of wisdom that are written like DNA code into creation. He who sins against me wrongs, check this out, you guys, wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. Really? Oftentimes subconsciously. We don't know that the principles by which we are relating to people are death in the form of relational dynamics. But you can sure see it on the fallen countenance when you spoke those words that were intended to wound. Dealing out death. And you also know that if you say words like, I like you, you're cool. Can we have lunch together? you know you're giving life. You can see it. You can watch the person raise their shoulders a little bit. Feel like, wow, the, they're dignified by the conference of love in the relationship. But he who hate, whoever hates me loves death. I'm going to put it this way. Every sin possesses a suicidal element. Every sin does. Now, it's, within, it's not within the parameters of this message, but it is equally true that every sin also has a homicidal element in it. Sin is the principle of death. It is a principle of chaos. It is, sin is anti-creational on the psychological, emotional, and relational level. It, it causes disintegration to occur in the person and in the relationships that the person is attempting to navigate by the principles of death. Now, this is incredible. Move away from death now in the opposite direction, and the Bible has this astounding idea articulated in Psalm 63, verse 3. This is, this is David in a song, in poetry, singing his heart out to God under inspiration. And he says, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Another version just says it just straight up. God's love is better than life. Better than life itself? Yes, yes. On a, in a hierarchy of value, love ranks higher than life. I mean, if you have to choose, if you have to choose between loving and living, keep choosing love. Keep choosing love. In every relational dynamic, choose love. Move in the trajectory, in the direction, in, in, in the narrative arc of your life, always moving toward and deeper into, higher up, to quote C.S. Lewis, higher up and deeper in, higher up and deeper in, into that love that does, in fact, define and compose the character of God. Love is better than life. Bio-life is measured in days. And all of our days are numbered. You know, what does the Bible say? Three score and 10, the average of 70 years. If you're in a blue zone, maybe 80 years, 90 years, right? That's if you lay off the veggie links. That's not food. Those are petroleum products, by the way. But if you understand biological life is measured in days, right? 
But Zoe life, the life that Jesus is speaking about over and over again, and the apostles are talking about over and over again, the Zoe life that is present in Jesus, the resurrection life of Christ is measured in love. It's a way of being. It's a way of being. It's a way of living into what we see on display in Christ. It's not meritorious, but it is expressive of the salvation that we have in Christ. In the book Desire of Ages, the author Ellen White describes it like this. Just, just process this with me kind of slowly in a measured way because this is profound. It will be seen... Let me pause right there. When all is said and done, we may as well see it now rather than waiting until we get to the other side of this nightmare, great controversy between good and evil that we're engaged in. Why not see it right now? But eventually you're going to see this. This will dawn on you. This is the grand epiphany. You'll see this sooner or later. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. That's the great paradigm shift. That's the thing to know and to believe. That the glory shining in the face of Christ is the glory of self-sacrificing love. Check this out. In the light, that is the, 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 the intellectual and emotional illumination, the realization in the light, in the light from Calvary, it will be seen, realized, that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. This will be seen sooner or later. If you haven't seen it yet, you're going to see it. It's the thing to see every day if you're going to see anything. And then she closes with this. This is profound. She says the law of self-sacrificing love is the law of self-preservation. Not selfishness. Love has a side effect. But love is contained in itself and of value in itself, and it's better than life itself. The law of self Sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. The law of self-serving is the law of self-destruction. That's either true or it's not, and everything that we've read in Scripture so far says it's true. She's not bringing to our attention some innovative idea. She's simply articulating what Scripture teaches regarding the resurrection life of Christ that we see on display in Him. Love is a life-giving, life-sustaining law. The word law here, as in the New Testament, by the way, but the way she's using it here as well, is, is a synonym for another word that we use, and that word would be principle. Don't think of law as in an arbitrarily imposed law, an externally imposed law, but a law that is embedded in the nature of things. Or think about it this way. God is love, and then God created the world and the universe. So his fingerprints are all over the thing. His character fingerprints are all over the universe. God is love and then God created. What is creation? Creation is God's love actualized in material form. We exist this moment because, precisely because God is love. In a world engineered for love, we have before us the fact that love is life-giving. Incrementally, you feel it every time you experience it, don't you? Somebody genuinely reaches out a comforting hand to give a gentle squeeze on your shoulder. Modern science and epigenetics are telling us that your white blood cell count actually goes up. A gentle squeeze on the shoulder, how are you doing? White blood cell count goes up. You're a more viable creature by positive social interaction. So love is life-giving and it is life-sustaining. It is a law, it is a principle. So we come back to the resurrection. This is profound. God raised him, that is Jesus, from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, comma, because, don't miss this, 
He's not content. Peter is not content to just say, God raised him from the dead, period, full stop. That's the end of it. Let's close with prayer. No, I'll tell you why. Let's look under the hood. What is it that is going on here? Because it was not possible. It was impossible that death should hold him. Why? Because Jesus, when he died on the cross, died with the love of God intact. He never yielded to a single self-serving, selfish impulse. He died loving you and me more than his own existence. When he closed his eyes and he died, the great controversy between good and evil was won. It was over. In principle, it was over. He won the great controversy. It is is now inevitable that you and I are going to live forever. And I'm looking forward to it. So, so, so the resurrection of Christ is the triumph of love over selfishness. But listen, listen very carefully. There are three great theories of human identity that run contrary to the gospel of Christ and contrary to the resurrection life of Christ, which is our true identity. Three great theories, not great in the sense that they are dazzling and impressive. In fact, they're not impressive at all. They're great as in the sense that these are the three great theories of human identity that have exerted the most influence over the last 120 to 150 years or so. These are the the three great theories of human identity that permeate Western academia. These are the three great theories that the entire advertising industry is constantly feeding us. We are are receiving it by education and by osmosis all the time. One of these three great theories of human identity or some weird, monstrous combination of the three. And they were articulated for us by Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Sigmund Freud. And they go something like this. According to Karl Marx, human identity is primarily economic. In the Communist Manifesto, he articulated that it's money that determines human viability and identity. This is the primary factor. He says in this, in in his defining of human identity, by possessing the property of buying everything. That is just, just, just sheer purchasing power. Money is thus the object of imminent possession. It's the thing you need most is the thing you've got to have. You've got to have cash. Let's, let's arrange society in such a way to make sure everyone has cash. Because cash is a thing. And we're going to engineer a distribution system to make sure everybody has cash because cash is primary for human identity. That for which I can pay, check this out, that which money can buy, that am I myself as the possessor of the money. Human identity is primarily a matter of economics, economic considerations, economic distribution, and the ability to buy things. This is not entirely false. I mean, you you have rent to pay, and you need to buy food, and money's not bad to have. Everybody here probably wishes they had a little more. But he's defining human identity identity in terms of an economic consideration. Friedrich Nietzsche comes along, and he says, no, 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 no. No, Well, not entirely no, because he was actually somebody who subscribed to some of the same economic principles as Marx, but he says no. And I'm quoting Friedrich Nietzsche now. Life simply is the will to power. Will to power. That's what it's about. And he goes on, he says, my idea, that is my philosophy of life and human identity, is that every specific body, that is every individual, every community, every nation, every specific body strives to become master over all space and to extend its force, that is its will to power, and to thrust back all that resists its exertion, extension. So this this is what it means to be human. This is primary. For Sigmund Freud, human identity is primarily primarily has to do with the sexual urges of the human person. Sexuality, Freud said, is the key to the problem of psychoneurosis and neuroses in general. In other words, everything that is wrong with us, everything that, that we suffer from, all of our messed upness 
is traceable to some kind of breakage in our sexual identity. No one who disdains the key that is sexuality will ever be able to unlock the door. The behavior of a human being in sexual matters is often a prototype of the whole of his, mode, his other modes of reaction in life. So, so, so for, for Freud, everything, human identity is a primarily sexual issue, and that's the great theories that dominate human consciousness. I am my capacity to purchase. I am my capacity to exert control over my environment and my peers. I am my sexuality. There's a fourth theory, and it goes something like this. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Amen. To the degree that I define myself in terms of money, power, or sexuality, to the degree that I limit my identity by those external factors and my power to manipulate those factors, I am operating outside of the parameters of the greater and primary identity. I am a majestic creature of the divine image made mentally, emotionally, and biologically to love and be loved. I am... You are, we are, recipients of the love of God. The ascension of Christ after his resurrection places our identity in the future by faith. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 21, 20 and 21, he, that is God the Father, raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand. Why the right hand? The right hand of the Father is the victory position. This is, we don't, we don't live as believers toward victory, but from victory. Amen. He raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Right now, a member of the human race occupies the throne of the universe. His name is Jesus. The book of Hebrews says he's our brother and not ashamed of it. I'm your elder brother, and I'm holding this place for you. Here, at the right hand, the victory position of the Father. Come on, hurry up. Could you all get up here with me to occupy the throne? Because this is your rightful place. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive, past tense, with Christ, by grace you are saved. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. We're there with him in the representative sense. This is how the Bible thinks the Bible speaks in, in representative language and solidarity language and corporate language. We do this even today. We say, if, if we have the ambassador of the United States to China over in China having political talks with political officials in China, right? We say, we, Americans, are in political conversations with China. No, we're not, I'm not, you're not, but somebody is. Our representative, somebody from the United States government is over there having conversations on our behalf. God help us. I have no idea who it is or what the issues are. But we're represented corporately. In the Desire of Ages by Ellen White, in closing, the angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into a fellowship with Christ, which is closer than even they themselves can know. Jesus is our brother in the flesh, 
and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the angels, the unfallen angels, we all have a guardian angel, according to Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, every child is attended by a guardian angel. We're attended by a guardian angel, according to Jesus, throughout life. Some of you have two or three angels. God is constantly deploying angels, extra angels, because you're trouble with a capital T. And some of you are just no problem at all, and there's one angel, and he's traveling the universe with Gabriel occasionally taking a vacation, because you're fine. But the fact is that the angels are wooing us and drawing us into a relationship with Christ that is closer than even we ourselves can, that they themselves can know. They're like, you know, right, right beyond this threshold, I mean, I'm going to woo you and I'm going to draw you, but then you're going to cross a threshold into an intimacy with God that only a sinner saved by grace can know and comprehend and feel. You and I are possessors in the present tense of the victory life, the resurrection life of Christ. Would you pause with me right now to just receive that life all over again and say yes to it? Say yes, Jesus. Yes to the life, the resurrection life, the Zoe life, the life of love that I see in you that is contrary to all hate and animosity and Jesus, please take control of my, my Twitter and Facebook account because I've been dealing out some death up in there. Please, God, please, Jesus, thank you for the life that we have in Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's respond together. Would you stand if you are willing and able? And let's just express in whatever way you would like in worship. Raising your hand is a form of surrender, but it's also a form of victory. So we claim both of those things as we sing our last song here together.
a hand on someone next to you, brothers and sisters. We are part of the family of God. If your heart is not warm in Jesus, I don't know if you're alive. Amazing Father, as we embrace each other here in this place, Lord, we know that your arms are right around us. My child, I love you. My child, I've been seeking after you. My child, I have blessings in abundance just waiting for you. Just ask. Just ask. And so tonight, Father, we want to just first off say, please, Lord, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Please, Lord, continue to revive us, wake us up, bring about a passion for you and the kingdom and the gospel and the way in which you're calling us to live that is reckless 
to forgive, to forgive the enemy? No. And yet you forgave us. You're resurrecting dead things tonight, God. And so, Lord, my prayer is that you would start knocking as you've been knocking, but now, Lord, please help us to open the door of those spaces we don't want anyone to see. We don't want to talk to that person. We don't want to go back to that memory. But, Lord, help do a revival in our heart this evening as we heard your word resurrect, bring back to life. I'm praying over marriages. I'm praying over finances. I'm praying over dreams that seem to have been completely gone. I'm praying over friendships that seem to have died. God, I'm praying over every single space in our life that we don't think can come back. God, revive. Resurrect, oh Lord. Jesus, we're so grateful that you resurrected 2,000 years ago because your promise is because I resurrected. Come on, because I resurrected, the promise is still alive that those spaces can come back to life. And so, holy God, help us believe again. Help us believe and walk around knowing that that resurrection power has been given unto us as well to speak life into the dead things. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we say, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. You may have a seat. This evening we have a wonderful Q&A that's about to begin. I have a QR code that's right behind me on your screen. If you're watching online, we want you to just pull out your cell phone. Maybe a question emerged right now that you want to share with our panelists. And so please do consider that right now. But before you go anywhere, I just have one very special announcement for you that I'm going to ask Pastor Linda to come up to share with us about what's happening Saturday night. You do not want to miss this. What's happening? Good evening, everyone. So Saturday, as soon as we are done here, I invite all of you to join us down at the amphitheater where the cafe is. We will have our doors open and we will be just having communion with all of you. We will have food available for you guys to purchase, some soup, some teas, some hot chocolate, pastries, wonderful things. No corn dogs, as Pastor Philip no, right. mentioned, but Where it's cashew okay. Cashew burgers, cashew burgers. We will have a lot of good food okay. for you guys. So we invite you guys to join us Saturday right after our afternoon program. Thank you so much, Pastor Linda. If you've never stopped by our church cafe, it is incredible. The menus change. They have everything every day. I was there today and yesterday. I think I'm their, their greatest person that probably spends the most in there. I'm sorry. But uh, friends, thank you so much for being here this evening. As our panelists come up right now, I just have two announcements to share with you briefly. First off is the very practical one. As you're leaving, if you'd like to leave right now, you're more than welcome to. There are greeters at the doors that are holding offering plates as well. If you'd like to be generous and just supporting the work of these sort of events and the ministry of this church, please do consider doing that. Friendship Cup will also be happening after the Q&A, and so we hope you'd stay and linger with us. Last thing I'm going to just share with you is the same thing I've said every single night. Please, 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 if your heart has been touched by these messages, would you go onto our YouTube channel, subscribe there, like every message, but share them. You know, the gospel goes forth when someone shares the gospel. The Holy Spirit can do a mighty work in someone's life, but when you share truth with people, lives are changed. And so please, would you consider sharing those messages? Thank you so much. Friends, the time is yours. Thanks, Thank you, Philip, very much. Uh, delighted to be up here with you guys again. Amen. Every single presentation this week, both on Sabbath, throughout the evenings, and 11 a.m., has just been so rich. It's just hard to put it into words. Just profound. 
So I want to start where we left off last night, and that's with Calvary, because we still have some questions about that. But I want to start out by just sharing one of my all-time favorite quotes from Peter Larson. I think of this every year at, at Easter and at Christmas. Despite our efforts to keep him out, God intrudes. The life of Jesus is bracketed by two impossibilities, a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Come on. Jesus entered our world through a door marked no entrance and left through a door marked no exit. <laughs> Is that amazing? <laughs> Absolutely. That's just an amazing quote. <laughs> Beautiful quote. So, so going back to Calvary, somebody stopped me last night after the session was over and said something that has always bothered me about my thoughts about God has to do with this thing called substitutionary atonement. Mm. Kind of this sense that God, forgive me, but had to kill his son in order to be okay with us. What would you say, the three of you, any of you, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, I'll, okay, because you guys are looking at me to, because uh, for some reason, okay, so <laughs> I, can I return to John Stott for a moment? Last night we recommended a book called The Cross of Christ. Jeffrey qu quoted from the book, um, The Cross of Christ by John Stott. Um, years and years ago I learned in that book a concept that I then developed in a book that I wrote called, the, uh, called Shades of Grace. And this is the idea of the, the two-party versus three-party view of the atonement. So the, the general view is that at the cross of Calvary, we see three parties. God, the offended party, the one who's been sinned against. The offender, that's the sinner, the one who's done the sinning against God. And then a third party, that's Jesus, the third party whipping boy, the, 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 the third party individual that God will, God will hurt him rather than us. God will, God will punish him rather than us. This is, this is the idea, it's three-party view of the atonement. It's very common. Um, it's not a Christian view. It's, it's actually Pagan. paganism in its, in its uh, basic philosophical contours. It's, it's not really in the Bible. But then there is the two-party view of the atonement. The two-party view of the atonement says there is God, the offended party, the one who's been sinned against, and there's the sinner, and the one hanging on the cross is God. Correct. So this is why the divinity of Christ is so vital as a, as a doctrine, as a teaching, right? And, and the doctrine of, of the triune God, the Godhead, is so vital. Because, because according to the two-party view of the atonement, God is not demanding sacrifice, but rather making the sacrifice. He's the one that's, that, that is absorbing in himself the debt the loss, the pain, the shame, the death. So in that sense, Jesus is our substitute in the sense that he is our representative head. He's the second Adam, he's the, he's the new man, he's the eschatological human, but he is, he is a combination of divine and human. He's 100% human, 100% God, we can't comprehend this. You know, sometimes called the hypostatic union. We don't, this is beyond our comprehension. But, but the one who's making the sacrifice and undergoing the suffering is God. Not a third party that God is venting on, but God himself is saying, I'll take the, I'll take the pain, I'll take the blow, I'll take the shame, I'll take the guilt. You're, David, you're free, mm -hmm. I'm going to endure the pain. Correct. I, I think that's what we mean, that's what the gospel means, I think, when we speak of substitutionary atonement. That's powerful. That's, that, really that's John Stott. Again, if, that book is pretty powerful. It's, yeah. it's very much worth reading. And one of the, it's very important to bear in mind the key distinction between the two-party atonement and three-party atonement. Ty said this just in passing, but in a three-party atonement view where you have God, sinners, and Jesus as a third party to the atonement, this is basically tantamount to paganism. It's, it's the sacrifice of something that's dear to him it's child sacrifice is what it is. And I want to read you an incredible verse in Jeremiah chapter 19. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 5. This is God's critique of Israel's um, ventures into paganism. 
one of the reasons that God insisted on the dispossession of the Canaanites was because child sacrifice was common. And we now know this archaeologically, but the Bible speaks about it directly. And this is God's critique. And I want you to hear what it says. It's incredible. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 5, it says, They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. And then this, Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. Mm. Okay, so what God is saying here is this idea of the sacrifice of another, of a third party, is so revolting to me, so disgusting and repulsive, it never entered my mind. So you can get your mind wrapped around the biblical view of the substitutionary atonement when you realize that's not a third party on the cross. That's God on the cross. Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. And one of uh, of the great interactions, and I believe, I don't know if anybody else agrees with this, but I believe that there will be at least during the millennial period and perhaps forever, we will be able to go in and watch scenes from human history and just watch them like movies, like in kind of IMAX, an immersive experience where we'll be able to see these Mm. things that happen. And one of the scenes that I want to see is the interaction between Pontius Pilate and Jesus. Mm. Because when, when Jesus comes before Pilate, Pilate is of the mind that Jesus is a little out of his depth, doesn't really understand what's happening. And you get the sense, even from the text, that he's trying to get him off. And so he kind of steps up close to him and says, you know, this is my paraphrase, but, you know, listen, young man, you're in a situation here, but I can help you out. I can tell you're not the normal kind of criminal that I'm accustomed to seeing, so work with me here. I'm trying to help you out. And he says, and Jesus is not biting, it's not taking. And then finally, Pilate sort of tries to scare Jesus into some sense of of awareness of the dire situation that he's in. And he says, hey, look, I have the power to crucify you. Pulls out the big guns. And then Jesus says, you have no power at all. You have no power at all. I am here. I am here because I choose to be here. My father and I met together. I, this, all of this, of course, goes right over Pilate's head. He has no idea what Jesus is saying here. But the point is, no one took Jesus' life from him. Yeah. He laid it down himself. He's not a third party to the atonement. That would be terrible. That's paganism. It's not good news either. But the gospel is good news, and the good news is that God gave himself. That's Paul's favorite phrase, really, often when writing of the gospel. He gave himself. He gave himself. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who gave himself for me, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's the gospel. Since you read the Jeremiah text, I I can't help but at least bring for your notes, for the note takers, you should examine um, Micah chapter 6 because this is an Old Testament uh, theme. Uh, Micah chapter 6, starting with verse 6, there are a series of rhetorical questions. Right. What shall I, what, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased, pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn, my child, human sacrifice? Shall I give my firstborn For my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin sin of my soul? Is this a transactional arrangement? Correct. Is this a salvation by works arrangement? If I give enough rams or rivers of oil or even my son, my my firstborn son, if I give my child, will that suffice? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Correct. This doesn't please God. Not even animal sacrifices please God. I wish we had time to talk about that. This is, a, this is a band-aid on a gaping chainsaw wound on the human soul, even animal sacrifices. The Old Testament over and over again, God is saying, I don't even want you sacrificing animals, but you're so psychologically wounded and dysfunctional that if you don't offload your violence to an animal sacrifice, it's going to bleed out into society. So I'm going to deal with you where you are, but check this out. What does God want? He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. God's not into, God is not a bloodthirsty Molech or Baal. 
God is love, and this isn't even just a New Testament truth. David and I are quoting from the, old, from the Hebrew Scriptures. God has always been in this frame of mind. God is not schizophrenic in his character. I, so think, just, I wonder even if this sheds any light on the sacrifice of Abraham and his son. It right. sure does. Because you, you've been quoting over and over in Scripture here about how God is not interested in child sacrifice right. or human sacrifice. And here the great test of faith that we often in, in the Christian tradition mention and even extol is Abraham willing to offer his son and then God stops him Correct. as if to say, mm. Abraham, I'm, I'm sharing this with you or presenting yes. this as your test only because this is the frame of reference that Correct. you would understand. And when God says no, it is to say, I am a different type of God than Correct. what you can conceive of. Yes. Right? Amen. Yes. It, the, the, the Abraham Isaac thing is an emancipation exercise from pagan theology. Correct. God isn't seriously asking for human sacrifice. He's asking of Abraham what Abraham expects God to require from his pagan upbringing to bring him up to the height of the emotional moment with the knife lifted, and then God stops his hand and said, no. I don't require no, supreme sacrifice, I, I provide it. No, I'm, I'm gonna provide the sacrifice, I'm not requiring the sacrifice. And, and th my favorite thing about that story, I'm so sorry, we're going long here, Randy. <laughs> but just very briefly, the best thing about that story is as they're making their way up Mount Moriah, Isaac is looking around and he says, oh, we've got the wood, we've got the fire. Oh, Dad, we forgot something. We forgot the lamb. And then Abraham unwittingly, unknowingly preaches the gospel when he says, what? God, God himself will provide yes. the lamp. That's the gospel. Exactly. That's amazing. We, a lot of us in this community have been reading through the Bible again this year, so I just read that story a couple yeah. of days ago. And what's so powerful about that is you read, remembering that this is Moriah is right in the, not far from where Calvary would be many, many years later. Correct. And it says twice that Abraham and Isaac, father and son, walked on together. together together. Yeah, yeah. It's an emphasis there that will come later. And then that question, which is the question of the Hebrew scriptures, right. where is the lamb? The, lamb? the New Testament answers, behold the lamb, and heaven cries out, worthy is the lamb. Yeah. Randy, so you the love lamb. this. There's a gospel twinkle in, in your eye. <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it's just amazing how beautiful it is. It nobody is. could have made this up. Yeah. No, nobody could have invented this story. And you know what? D just just so that the Jewish nation would never misunderstand the nature of sacrifice. Of course, they did end up, it, paganism crept into the Jewish uh, practices of sacrifice in both the first and second temples. But God did his best to communicate that that's not what's going on here because he had them build the temple where? On Mount Moriah. Exactly. I mean, the, the lesson the was unmistakable. The very place where God had not required supreme sacrifice, but provide. So if ever there was an opportunity to be inoculated from paganism, it was in having your place of sacrifice in the very location where God said, this is what sacrifice is, and this is what it isn't. And yet, astonishingly, because paganism is inbuilt to fallen human nature, they began to inculcate those ideas. By the way, I just have to add this. That, no, seriously, seriously. Paganism, paganism, the idea of transactional salvation has a spectrum. So on the far end of the spectrum is human sacrifice. Salvation by works everywhere else on the spectrum is the same basic thing in principle. So to the degree that I am psychologically relating to my failures and sins by feeling as though I need to do something in order to get back in good with God before coming to God, mm -hmm. right? That's paganism. Yeah. That's, that's not the gospel. Powerful. So I got to get to some of these questions okay. that, people have, uh, that people have texted in, sent in. How do we know we love God with all our heart and our neighbors ourselves? How do we know that? Now, what you presented tonight, Ty, was, was really rich and deep and a whole different view of some of that material. But if somebody's sitting there thinking, I have good feelings or I don't have good feelings, yeah. does that mean I love? Does that mean I don't love? How do we know we love God? How do we know we love our neighbor? I'm glad there's a, defi there's a definition of love, right? Correct. Like we're provided with an actual concrete definition that describes, that wraps 
language around what is love, right? We could read 1 Corinthians 13. We could read these types of passages. And I think that's what you were saying in your sermon. Part of what you said is, uh, remember you said, what was the language we, we act our way into? Yeah, we act, we, our, our feelings follow our actions, not the other way around. Right, right. Yeah. So I think we have a definition, a reference point that helps us identify what love looks like. And I think I'm very, very appreciative of that because in our society, love is very, it's like this undefined thing right. that, that the best, so many musicians, they can just boil it down to this feeling. And I think that's why that question is so relevant because it's in the air of our culture, right? You love when you feel it, and you don't love when you don't feel it. It's important but. to understand this because oftentimes someone will, will experience abuse, for example. Somebody crosses a line and abuse has occurred. Is it legitimate to not feel positive towards someone, and is it possible to not feel positive towards someone and yet love them? The answer is yes. We need to distinguish, for example, between forgiveness and trust. So, so you know, a, a child that is, is abused by a father, for example, to give an example that is very common, um, we will often have people come to us and say, you know, I'm a Christian, I know I should forgive my dad uh, for what he did to me as, as a child, but I can't. And, and, and I'll, I'll say, well, do you wish that, that he would repent for what he did and, and, and call it the ugly thing that it was when he abused you? Yes. yes. Do, do, you, do you wish that he would be so repulsed by what he did to you that he will never do it to another person? Yes. And then I say, well, you have forgiven him then. Correct. And it has nothing to do with your feelings. And you don't have to have Tuesday night pizza dinner with him. And you certainly shouldn't let him babysit your kids. So you can, you can forgive someone and not be fond of them. You can forgive someone and call the police on them. You can forgive someone and create a, a perimeter, a boundary that they're not allowed to cross because of their abuse. Don't confuse emotional sentiment with love and forgiveness in those settings. Boundaries are legitimate. You can love someone but not trust them. That's a very important truth, mm. a, really a truly an important truth. If people could grasp that, I think a lot of what happens in relationships uh, would be different. I agree. Very good. Why does God not reveal himself more often? Both Christians and atheists struggle to find evidence for the evidence of God's existence. Now, you all have dealt with that in powerful ways at the 11 o'clock meetings, but how would you briefly summarize a response to that? Why doesn't God just come down here on Mount San Gorgonio, shake the mountain, and reveal himself? If there's not room for reasonable doubt, free will vanishes. Yeah, now that's true. That's absolutely true, that, that belief cannot be of such a quality that it's coerced or it's, com it's mandatory. Yeah, because, if God appeared right now, we'd all get baptized. But, but there's an important idea, exactly, but there's an important idea here that I think a lot of people don't understand that these, these punctuations, these miraculous punctuations that we feel like are so common in the Bible are actually rare, exceedingly rare. Yeah. Uh, so for example, when, when the angel appears to Gideon and he says, you know, and he's hiding there behind the tree and, and the, the Amorites and the others have encroached on Israel's territory and the angel says, hey, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, who, who are you talking to? And then, you know, the angel of the Lord says, you. And now listen to what Gideon says. You can read this in Judges 6. He says, if, God is, if Yahweh is with us, then where are all the miracles that our fathers talked about? Okay, wait a minute. We have this idea that yeah, the Bible, yeah. that, that, that the time before modernity was just chock full of miracles. In fact, relative to the total number of miracles that Jesus could have performed, he performed a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Think of the Pool of Bethesda. The Bible says it was full of sick people. How many did, how many did Jesus heal? One. So, so we have to disabuse our mind of the idea that God primarily communicates through miraculous interventions and punctuations. That is the exceedingly rare circumstance even in the text of Scripture. The Red Sea in the Exodus is referred back to over and over again because nothing like that happened again. It was a one-off. 
right? It was something that was miraculous, the parting of the Red Sea. Now, you can say the Jordan River. Have you been to the Jordan River? I mean, it's not terribly impressive to part the Jordan River. But the Red Sea was a different kind of a thing. And so the idea, we have this idea that God needs to show up in these great, miraculous interventions and punctuations. That's just not how God usually operates. It's not how he operated in the Old Testament. It's not how he operated in the New Testament. Even back then, miracles were the exception, not the rule. And I'm going to just say, I'll ask you guys on the platform here, who here, I'll ask all of us, who here has seen something or experienced something that you would regard as fitting the definition of a miracle? You witnessed it firsthand or you experienced it firsthand? Anybody? I have. Okay. I would say two in my, Randy, no? I'd say two no. in my life. Uh, well, I've been alive for 50 years. This is clearly the exception. So in answer to the question, why doesn't God make himself more known? God is making himself ubiquitously known in all the wonderful ways. Family, friends, mangoes, sunsets, music, <laughs> children, rock climbing. I mean, God is making himself ubiquitously known. But if what you mean by that is, why don't I see more miracles, is that's not God's primary mode of operation. And... You wouldn't want that to be God's primary mode of operation because God then just becomes a kind of vending machine that needs to be continually proving and demonstrating his presence with greater and greater manifestations to keep you now like an addict, satisfied and fixed that God is still with you. Oh, no, 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 no. We are surrounded by evidences of God if we will but see what is right in front of us. Randy, can I just emphasize one thing? I just recently saw an interview. Does the name Francis Collins? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, definitely to you, um, uh, does the name Richard Dawkins sure. ring a bell? So I saw an interview with Francis Collins, I think the Human Genome Project, Correct. right? He was the Correct. leader. Correct. And he wrote uh, Signature of? Uh, the Language of God. The Language of God. Yeah. And then Richard Dawkins, of course, right? Um, the God Delusion, and, you know, famous atheist from Oxford. Anyway, in the interview, the, the person asked, he, there's these two giant intellectuals. They're both there? Both there, and okay. both scientists. So the question was posed, you're both scientists, respected scientists, so why would one end up a believer in Jesus and the other an avid rejecter of God? Because the same content, because the question is in the context of skepticism and atheism, right? right. But the same content is available to both, right? Correct. So then what is it that makes the difference? Is it the fact that God unleashed a greater amount of content to the one versus the other, and that's why one believed and one didn't? And the point is that it's the same content, but it's the perspective, right? It's the worldview. So if you have, if you have uh, glasses on and they're tinted pink, everything you look at looks pink, right? Correct. So it depends what lens you're looking through. So I think that that question is fascinating, but I don't think the content of what God has revealed, if only God revealed himself more, more atheists would tomorrow convert, right? Maybe it has... It's the nature of atheism. Right, right. So it has to do more, I think, with, with the worldview. And so I think the process of conversion is that God invites us, try this lens on. Ooh, and yeah. then everything That's looks exactly different, correct. right? And so I th there's, a, there's more experience there, I think, than there is, like on God's part revealing himself. Am I allowed to add one thing? Absolutely. Okay, so, so um, Jewish scholars have this idea called zimzum. Zimzum is the idea that, when, that when, when God created human beings, he backed up, he receded to create sufficient space for free will to occur. So if God were absolutely unequivocally obvious, like you said, why doesn't he just appear in the building as, you know, with his head brushing the ceiling in all his majesty, well, all of us would immediately be obligated by the sheer majesty of the event. The fact is that Jesus is the medium through which God appears to us in veiled form, mm. right? So that we can fall in love with his character preparatory to meeting him face to face. This is John chapter 1. No, man, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son. He has seen him, and I'm here to reveal him. When we encounter the character of God in Christ, and we fall in love with God for who he is in character, then we can encounter him face to face and not be intimidated. But it, prior to love, 
to encounter God? We, we, we would worship him for a few hours, and the moment he vanished, two days later, we'd be back to our old ways. Nothing would have changed in our hearts fundamentally. We need to fall in love first, and then Revelation 22, verse 4 says, we shall see his face. We'll see his face. We're going to have eye-to-eye -eye contact with God. Beautiful. Woo. One comment and then one last question. Please. So to follow up, David, on what you were saying, if you look at Scripture, what we would call the miracles are primarily, not exclusively, but primarily clustered in three times. Correct. One Correct. is the time of the, of the Exodus, mm -hmm. the entrance to the, the, yep. the Canaan's land. Yep. Second was the time of Elijah and Elisha. Correct. And the third one is the time of Jesus in the early church. That's right. Each time in which God is doing something dramatic and different, and what the miraculous does is serve to say, pay attention, I am moving, I'm doing something dramatic and different. Think about the fact of what happened with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah meets, you know, the, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, the God who answers by fire, down comes the fire, they're on their faces, Jehovah's God. Less than 24 hours later, he's in the depths of depression because he realized nothing has changed. So he goes back to reconnect with God at Mount Sinai, Mount Oreb, and finds there the, in the silence that God speaks. Yes. And at that point in the biblical narrative, God's way of revealing himself shifts. The next time you see God is not in the grand and dramatic, but in a baby who's weeping in a manger. It just shifts entirely. So, so he's doing something dramatic there as he did at the Exodus, as he does at the time of Jesus in the early church. So it's not, as you so well said, the common mundane way that God works. Last question. Somebody sent this in. Simple. How do I resurrect my passion for God? Grown cold, how do I resurrect my passion for God? I, I just <laughs> said, I just said a bunch of stuff about it. I already said everything I know about it. You, you guys should say, it's supplement what I s answer the question. So I, just I, would, about I would say, okay, uh, Jeffrey, I'll say something and then you say something because Ty had a long time. You talked about that idea. But, but I would say, first of all, it's good. Let me back up even a little further. I do believe it's completely normal and perhaps even healthy to have seasons and cycles in a Christian's life of greater and lesser activity. Um, not necessarily greater and lesser devotion or love, but just sometimes you have more time on your hands. You have more discretionary time. You know, I was talking to a young man, actually right there this morning. He came up to me after the presentation. He said, look, I'm an agnostic. I find your presentations and ties interesting, but I'm so busy right now. I, I, I'm like, I got boards in March. I'm studying. I'm trying to keep my head above water. Like I'm, and I said to him, I said, brother, this is the season you are in right now. You're going to have time to read and study and learn and grow. But right now in this season, right now, don't close any doors. Uh, stay open. Don't close any doors permanently because the person that you are right now, this is not going to be your life going forward. You, you are going to have more discretionary time. You're going to get married. You're going to, have a, you're going to have children. You're going to have... And so the one thing I would say is recognize that often we mistake the sort of, oh, I'm a little down. I'm not... This is just a season in your life. You're busy. You're under financial stress, maybe a health crisis or something. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're not a follower of Jesus and that you don't love him. So don't confuse those seasons and cycles that are just normal to living with, oh, I used to be more on fire. Well, maybe you just used to be more available. Maybe you just used to have more time. Maybe now you have a two-year-old that's crying in the night. Different, that's a different situation. And so too often I think, and ministers, we fall into this trap of basically saying to people, we don't mean to say this, but it's kind of like, look, if you're not involved, then you don't really believe the message. But that doesn't take on board the fact that people have complicated lives and they'll have seasons of greater and lesser availability, greater and lesser time to read, greater and lesser time. But even in those what we might call drier seasons, just make sure you're keeping a connection, right? Read a psalm a day, spend a little time in prayer, smile at somebody, give a Bible study, and then later in your life, you might have an opportunity to be the personal ministries director. You might end up in some incredible capacity. So don't, and don't negative self-talk. In those seasons, don't say, oh, I used to be so on fire, and now I'm... No, 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 say it like this. Say, 
I can't wait till I have more opportunity to be as involved as I have been before. You see the difference? Now you're, now you're speaking to yourself in a way that is infused with the gospel rather than woe is me, I used to be on fire, now I'm not anymore. No, no, don't say that. You're still on fire. You still believe the gospel. Read a psalm a day, start being kind to people, and then when a season or an opportunity opens up, plug into it. It's plug practical. into it. So good. Yeah, these are very practical. That's just very hopeful. I love that, David, so much. I also think of the parable of the ten maidens that Jesus told about. Yeah. Yes. Ten of them slept. Yeah. Ten of them. Ten of them, not, not five of them. Of them. Exactly. Not nine. Thank God he didn't say nine of them slept because we'd be like, well, you know, <laughs> That's we didn't true. sleep. That's right. <laughs> and I wonder, I've wondered if Jesus isn't in a subtle way saying, I understand you cannot perpetually live in the heat of anticipation and on the tiptoe of expectation. You can't live your life that way. There is a way in which you can be faithful and live in him if, and be ready. If you want to read a great book to this effect, this is a game-changing book. It's called A Long Obedience in the yes. Same Direction. Read, by the Eugene way, I, Peterson. By the way, I think Peterson. that's maybe the best book title of any book ever. The book oh, title God's is... God's Search for Man God's Search for Man is also Jeshua. good. This is top five. <laughs> Eugene Peterson wrote a book called... A long, listen to the title, a long obedience in the same direction. That's what you're doing. The Christian life is a marathon. You already have eternal life. You are in the good grace of God because of Jesus. It's not a sprint. Stay on this path. Read that book. Stay connected to Jesus. Smile at people. And we're going to spend eternity with yes. one another. Amen. Yes. Amen. Just beautiful. Would you thank our three friends? We love what you're doing. We'll see you out in the fellowship hall for a few minutes this evening. But before we close here, I want to remind you of just a couple of things. One, there will be prayer team members over here to your left and my right. If you would like to pray about some of these matters, if you're viewing online, you see the phone number that appears. Our prayer team is available for the next 30 minutes. Would love to pray with you. Uh, it's on the screen now here in the, in the sanctuary as well as online. And we just want to say thank you so much for having been a part of this each evening. We have just a couple of more days tomorrow. More, if you haven't been here at 11 o'clock, you're missing something profound and important. So at least find it online. And then tomorrow night and on Sabbath again. But let's end this evening with just a word of prayer. Gracious God, thank you. We have been richly fed, and now we need to exercise our faith in meaningful ways in our relationship with you and others. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.